Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for showing up today. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, I want to um, commend uh, the MRA for uh, uh, having the foresight to to start this webinar series. And I'd like to thank PMI for being um, uh, uh, supporting the community um, by presenting these. Um, so when um, uh, when Sean and I and, and Tom at first talked about about this webinar series, um, we had talked a little bit about uh, you know the fact that most of uh, most search and rescue teams are small nonprofits and what kinds of management issues might be important to them. Um, and it was early Sean and Tom who come, came up with the idea of you know social media fundraising and branding. And um, I want to thank them for that idea because it's given me the ability to to think a little bit more critically about how brand affects your fundraising and how social media can improve or promote both of those, those goals. So this is going to be a higher level presentation um, on, on fundraising and brand and social media. We're, I'm not going to touch too much on, you know, what's the ideal size for a um, Facebook cover photo. Uh, or the difference between a tweet and a retweet. Um, um, I think it's more important to think about the st strategy around uh, how you present yourself uh, through social media. And I want to thank those of you that are on this call um, for showing up because I understand that you know you're all more interested in you know the the latest doodad for uh, um, setting up an LDA or what's the you know the the latest procedure for treating a sucking chest uh, chest um, wound uh, while you're hanging off a cliff, um, and uh, so sometimes nonprofit management um, you know isn't the first thing on your mind. But you know in order to play in the dirt, you need revenue, and um, and so uh, so understanding you know the fundraising perceptions or f fundraising principles um, uh, and nonprofit management uh, principles is really important. So, but before we jump into that, let me just give you a quick uh, overview of myself. Um, you know, I was, uh, I grew up in a small rural town uh, not too far from Saginaw, Michigan. My dad was uh, the town barber. My mom worked at the dry cleaners. And I spent all my time um, tramping around the woods and forest outside around my home. And um, one of my favorite uncles was a bush pilot in Alaska, and I thought that was really cool. So I went to college to become a commercial pilot and uh, ended up graduating with a degree in business administration. Um, and after college, I moved to Colorado to get more of the outdoors, uh, to, to, to ski more, to uh, to, to climb and to do some mountaineering, uh, to hike and backpack, and um, and my first job out of college was selling office equipment, and um, that led me to computers, uh, and that led me to uh, starting and selling two software development companies, um, and when I started my second company, uh, I, I specifically wanted it to be a virtual business. I, I didn't want to have an office, and because of that, I had the flexibility to get uh, get more involved in my community. And one of the first things I thought about doing was to join the volunteer fire fire department. And um, but before that happened, I saw an article in one of the local lifestyle magazines about the Alpine Rescue Team, and I thought to myself, well, that's a whole lot cooler than going to car accidents. And so. I joined the team with the idea that if I could do this for 10 years, that would be enough. And I did it for 12. And over those 12 years, I spent, um, I was the uh, prospective member director, I was the training director, I was the president of the team, and um, served on the board of directors for probably eight of the 12 years. Um, I also had the privilege of being the regional chair of the Mountain Rescue Association for the Rocky Mountain region. Um, and search and rescue, the uh, being a nonprofit or Alpine being a nonprofit, I was um, uh, 
it, because it was a nonprofit, that led me to getting a master's degree in nonprofit management, where I now consult with organizations in the areas of marketing and fundraising and organizational development like strategic planning. Um, so one of the first things I, I, I like to talk to in nonprofits about is a lot of, a lot of small nonprofits um, and a lot of people in general have this feeling that uh, nonprofit organizations are different than for-profit businesses. And technically they're really pretty much the same. Uh, you know, it's important to understand that you have two things to deal with. One is income and the other is how you spend that income. And so, um, so business principles um, can, uh, you know, the same business principles you may use in your day job can apply to your nonprofit organization. Um, the way you get revenue is through essentially through fundraising. Now, um, the best nonprofits diversify their income. You know, they have income coming from a variety of different sources. And so in addition to simply things like individual gifts, those $25 to $50 gifts from people, they, they also leverage uh, grants from foundation, grants from government, um, uh, endowment funding or bequests. Uh, they also, um, uh, and also social, uh, social enterprise is becoming a big thing where small nonprofits or any nonprofits have a business that supports their mission, and that often manifests itself in, you know, job employment programs. But there's a whole host of things that you can do. But one thing I want want everybody to understand is you, you because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you you can't earn income. Um, and so, if there's anything about fundraising that you remember from this presentation, I want you to remember this. And that is, donors want to be investors in a well-managed organization that has an exciting plan for the future. And that's universal with all nonprofits, search and rescue included. You know, donors don't care about your needs. They don't care that you need a new litter or that you need a new um, rescue vehicle or a, a roof on your building. They care about their needs. And in your community, that essentially what that means is that um, they want to know that the, the most experienced, the most proficient um, team is coming to get them when, when they or someone that they love is in trouble, is when someone is having a bad day in the mountains. So, um, so when you understand that donors want to be investors in some sort of future, um, and that they select the best, uh, they select organizations to donate to based on how well managed they feel they are. It's that important to, uh, to put your best foot forward in all your communications. So while many, um, you know, while there are a lot of different sources for income for a nonprofit organization, um, Three quarters of the money, three quarters of the three hundred and eighty billion dollars a year that's gifted to nonprofit organizations comes from individuals, and so you really want to be able to target individuals. And the, Charlie Shemansky was the first person who said said to me that you know fundraising is really more about raising friends. Um, because fundraising is about relationships. It's about getting to know people on a one-to-one -one basis, understanding what it is, uh, what their needs are, uh, so that you can address those needs. And so one of the best ways to, um, to build those relationships is through an engagement process. So your goal should be to attract and acquire people that are like-minded, uh, people that are interested in your mission, people that are interested in the vision you have of the future. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. And um, one of the best ways is simply not to say dumb things. 
And what I mean by that is understand, developing some messaging that reinforces your brand. So what is a brand? Now, most people think of brand as, um, you know, logo or graphics. Um, you know, if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me that their marketing would be, uh, would be much better if they just had a cool logo, I'd be giving this presentation from a beach in Fiji. Um, brand is really about what people think when they hear your name. You know, think of it as um, your reputation in the community. And clear messaging really helps you build that strong brand that can resonate with donors. And um, so you can ask yourself, you know, what is your brand? You know, while all search and rescue teams, especially MRA teams, have a common mission, um, do essentially the same thing, each team can have some, some things that it specializes in, um, perhaps based on terrain, perhaps based on, you know, the kinds of training that you do, uh, perhaps based upon, um, you know, your leadership. It may have something to do with history. Uh, you may do more high angle or, or snow and avalanche work. Whatever that might be, you need to understand um, and get with your leadership and talk about what you're really strong at and what really separates you from, um, from everybody else. Now, in general, most our MRA teams have some of the similar characteristics. You know, I believe you all support No Charge for Rescue. Um, I don't know of any uh, search and rescue teams that have paid staff, so you're simply all volunteers. You know, you're non nonprofit. I um, I don't think many of you get directly get money like a volunteer fire department does from from a tax base. Uh, you're available 24/7. These are things that go into your value proposition. These are the kinds of things that um, are are important. Uh, for you to talk to the community about, and especially those people that you think that you want to uh, acquire and attract to your mission. Now, because you're all volunteer, um, um, you have a, a big, a big, big uh, advantage over a lot of other nonprofit organizations. One of the fastest growing nonprofits in the country right now is called Charity Water. Um, now that's for several different reasons. One is that um, they really understand and embrace marketing and do a good job at it. Um, two is because um, their mission is to help everybody in the world get clean drinking water, um, which is something that we can all relate to. But one of the other things that's a big benefit to them is that they have uh, a couple of angel investors that basically pays the salaries of their staff. So they can say to a potential donor that 100% of your donation goes to our mission, which is to provide clean drinking water for somebody in the world. Search and rescue teams, because you're all volunteer, do the same thing. When you go out and, uh, and uh, um, tell people about your mission and you tell people about what it is that you do, um, you can tell them that any money that they donate to you goes directly to the mission of helping people that are having a bad day in the mountains. So the next thing then to think about is who's that target audience? And in my mind, you kind of have two basic audience groups. The first is anybody that would give you any money. And that might, you know, that that can um, that can be people from um, in the outdoor, you know, people who spend a lot of times hiking and climbing in the outdoors, or go mountain biking, uh, or have friends and family who do that, um, and anybody who might influence somebody around your mission. So you have a pretty broad uh, demographic, a pretty broad target audience there. Um, 
because one of the things that you want to do, one of the things you want to do is kind of differentiate yourself from all the other organizations that are out there competing for donations. Um, you know, uh, you could probably slice and dice your particular demographics pretty carefully based on terrain uh, so that you might be able to target certain organiz organizations or groups of people or demographics of, of individuals that uh, um, might be more amenable to your message. Um, but basically it's anybody who, you know, uh, who will give you some money. The other one is the authority having jurisdiction. So this is a totally different audience group and it's important to always understand that um, that different audiences may receive, uh, may uh, re relate to different messages better than a, a, another way. So when you're talking to the AHG, J, um, you know, they're, they're wanting to know that, you know, you're the best resource for them to go to in certain particular situations. They want to know that you're highly professional. They want to know that, um, you know, how dedicated you are. And so just uh, when you think about audience, always think about who am I talking to and what is it that they are most interested in. So how do you really get an audience engaged? You know, I look at it, at it this way. Um, a lot of people think about marketing and they think about advertising. Marketing is, advertising is just a very small piece of marketing. Um, marketing uh, understands, marketing learns about the community and learns about the target audience and learns about the needs in the community. And then informs program to do, um, in, to, to um, manage the program so that it best addresses those needs. And then it communicates out to the community about all the good work and the impact that that program does. Think of it this way. Um, you go to a dance and you sit in the corner, you're never going to be able to go dance. Uh, what you want to do is be able to go out into the dance floor, talk to some people, and uh, and and ask them to dance. And in that conversation, you might want to talk about how you're the best slow dancer. And um, and if they don't know how to do the waltz, you're happy to teach them. Um, that's a lot. That has a lot to do with um, with what marketing tries to accomplish. So you need a strategy. You know, rather than just jumping in, think about. Uh, how you communicate and where your audience, um, um, what your audience is interested in to develop your tactics. Uh, all too often people look at individual tactics like advertising, for instance, or social media as an individual silo that you have to manage. But it's really part of a greater, broader, holistic um, approach towards um, promoting what it is that you do. Now one of the best things that I ever got from a program officer was this. Uh, she said that in evaluating grant proposals, uh, no stories without numbers and no numbers without stories. And what she meant by that was it's important to, for her to understand the impact through, the emotional, through an emotional connection of a story um, but she wants to also understand, um, you know, the numbers, the data that um, can back up your claims of impact. So I think it's Kaylee who asks for the uh, mission reports, the statistics every year. Um, you should be all over collecting that data and reporting it because MRA is collecting that data to support, you know, individual teams and to support search and rescue in general. You can use that data to better support your value to the community. And so what you all should really have is what's called a case for funding or a case statement 
which talks about the need in the community, your particular need in the community, how you address that need, and then what that impact is to the community. Um, and if, when you have that case for funding, it can, it can live in the form of a brochure, it can live in the form of a grant proposal, it can be on your website, whatever that may be, it gives you some of the talking points to, um, to, to, to address your community with. Now, the way communications in our world has changed forever. Uh, you know, we used to be much more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you know, I remember when you used to be able to pick up the telephone and somebody would answer. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, and now, people are, uh, because of the Internet and because of mobile devices, they're relating, they're, they're instantly tweeting um, song by song at a concert. They're um, taking photos and posting them on Instagram and and Pinterest and on their Facebook pages uh, about what's going on in their daily lives, sometimes some people from minute to minute. So it's important to be able to leverage that shift. And I think from a fundraising and branding perspective, it's a good shift. Now, the other thing you have to realize is that years ago, um, you could kind of hide on the Internet. You know, nobody knew who you were on the Internet. That's completely changed. And anybody can tell in a minute whether, you know, uh, you understand what you're talking about or you understand um, uh, that you're professional um, based on your digital presence. So it's important to put your best foot forward in, in, um, when you look at your digital presence. So why social media? What is it about social media? Well, social media gives you the ability to raise awareness for your mission. Uh, potentially, social media can help you increase donations. It can really get people excited about what it is that you do uh, and motivate supporters to help you everything from raising money to putting away the gear at the end of the day. Um, it can also serve to inform the public about what it is that you do and why it's important. So social media is a big, plays a big part today in um, your marketing strategy. Um, most importantly, and it was Anna D. Batiste who was with Summit County. Um, I remember sitting at an MRA business meeting and she was telling me about Twitter. Uh, I signed up during the meeting tweeted my first or tweeted my first um, post on Twitter from the from the meeting but the big thing and I think some of your some of your teams out there are doing this now is um, using social media to to communicate with the media before you hit the cameras to help develop that messaging I know that uh, you know there are, during a search uh, or any kind of uh, situation you know, you want to give the media, you know, specific information, and um, and uh, it's sometimes really hard to do that. And the media can be one of those things that's uh, your best. It can be your best friend and your worst enemy sometimes all at the same time. Um, in that, as hard as you try, they may still get your message wrong. So social media just helps you control that message. Now, I also want to talk to you about something a little bit bigger than just social media, and that's called content marketing. Content marketing is probably one of the most valuable tools for any nonprofit organization out there today, and it's been around for a long time. If any of you remember the Burma Shave um, signs that used to line the roads that would tell a story um, as you went from point A to B, B. Well, that was content marketing. And content marketing now manifests itself mainly um, in the Internet, but through, you know, your website, through infographics, through videos, through blog posts, um, and through social media ch channels. What it does is it gives you the ability to present yourself as an authority in your field or in your space. Um, because... 
donors don't want to be pitched. Um, you know, they don't want, rather than going to them with an open hand saying, you know, this is what we need, now what you can do is you can be a source for valuable information. And so when they think about who they may want to give money to, to support their interests or support their needs, you become one of the first people that they think of. So adopting a marketing, uh, a content marketing strategy for a nonprofit is highly, um, highly desirable today. Now, when you think about communication, all communications is social, and whether you're looking at um, your website or a social media outlet like Twitter or whatever. When you look at selecting a particular channel to work with, um, think about where does your audience live. So when you look at the demographics of your organization and you, um, the demographics of your target audience, think about where they, where you know, um, where they're getting their information first. Now. The rules of engagement with social media are pretty simple, and I like to look at it as, you know, if you only post or tweet about in a way that your grandmother would be happy, you're probably going to be okay. Um, as we were talking before, there's, you, you, on social media, you don't sell. Um, you know that humor goes a long way, as long as you know that you're funny. And so if you're going to post something that's humorous, I'd recommend you bounce it off a few people before you go about posting it. Um, you don't need to stress the small stuff. And let me just illustrate by saying the um, Greenpeace, uh, some time ago they started a, a marketing campaign to name um, a, uh, a Save the Whale uh, mascot um, that they uh, were um, bringing out. And so they were looking for, you know, um, a name that, you know, perhaps, a, you know, a Native American name that meant, you know, freedom or, or spirit or something like that. But what became the most um, popular name was Mr. Flashy Pants. Um, and as much as they tried to squash Mr. Flashy Pants, the more it got bigger. But in the end, Mr. Flashy Pants has been one of the most profitable campaigns they've ever done. So don't stress on the small stuff. Um, realize that you don't have to follow everyone back. Um, or wait, remember to follow people back, but you don't need to thank everybody for following you. Um, and you don't, just like you don't have to reply to everyone. And the other, another simple rule um, is, is message bombing. And what that means is, you know, one of the most frustrating things I, I remember about LinkedIn some time ago, people don't do this much anymore, was when they would post the exact same message on 15 different groups so that your whole page would be filled up with this exact same message. That's a clear way to get people to just start ignoring what it is that you're talking about. The other big thing about social media that um, you should keep in mind is that uh, grammar is really important. And grammar is important from the perspective of, uh, of creating that professional brand. Uh, because remember, one of the things that you're trying to do is you're trying to um, uh, illustrate your professionalism and, uh, and what it is that you do best. So grammar is one of those things that um, can very much help uh, in how you present yourself. Now, nobody has more stories than you guys. Um, you know, I remember all the time in um, talking to friends and family, they always wanted to hear stories, and I always had stories. 
Um, don't, stories help you to demonstrate impact. You know, storytelling has started at the dawn of time, and it's still a viable way of getting your point across today. Um, now, some of you might have asked yourselves, you know, why is he telling me about where he grew up and who, what his father did? Um, that's because you remember more about uh, statistics or data or facts when it's told in a story form than you will as if it was just presented as a resume. So one of the things, and I don't see this too often on, on, on the social media uh, channels that I looked at from some of you, the teams out there, is that I don't see stories. And, um, and that doesn't mean you can't have confidentiality in your stories, but you can use stories to, to, um, to teach a point, to, to be educational, to, to support um, the people that you do work for, uh, and to also demonstrate your impact. So, um, so storytelling is ex extremely important on social media. Image is another thing that um, is becoming more and more um, important. Uh, just about all the social media channels out there these days have um, the uh, have the ability to post a picture. And I've even noticed myself that if I were to post that, um, you know, the fox in her kit came by my neighborhood today um, as a text post versus a picture of the kit and the fo mama fox um, in my post, I'll get much more likes from the one with the photo than I will from the one that's just simply a text post. So, so adding images to your posts is important, um, whether that be a tweet or, or a Facebook post. But keep in mind that posts, uh, the, the images, um, while it's, it would be great if you could afford uh, and spend some money on professional photographers to do that. They have the ability to get lighting right, to come up with great images that illustrate points. But authentic is, is better than inauthentic. And so when you select a photo to illustrate whatever point you're trying to make, make sure that it's authentic. The other thing that you can learn, from, uh, learn about is that uh, when you mix an image with text or copy, um, it's much stronger in, pr in presenting your argument or what, whatever it is that you're trying to say. So making sure that those two things match and the image is, is appropriate is, is really important. Video is also another thing that's really important in today's um, social media and today's marketing, content marketing strategies. So this media, I know you're on different um, um, uh, different mediums. Some of you may be on uh, uh, on your web, on your computer, some may be on a, a mobile device. This might come up differently. It's a short three minute video. I want to show it because it illustrates a couple of things. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. 
Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So, um, some of the reasons I wanted to show that video is one, it gave me the opportunity to stop talking for about three minutes. But two, um, it also shows that um, you can illustrate your point through humor, um, and you can do it. Uh, uh, you can eas easily um, use humor to to get that point across. Also, if you notice, the quality of the video wasn't all that great. Uh, so you don't need to spend a lot of money on production value. Um, actually, some of, the, uh, some of the handheld videos that you see these days are actually quite good. And it also talks about, it also did a story. And so what they did is they, they presented their argument uh, in the story form um, and which made it much more entertaining. So, so video is becoming a, a real popular and very powerful thing for us to be able to use uh, through all kinds of social media channels today. Now, talking about social media channels, you know, one of the questions might be, which is the best for me? And I can't really answer that for you because each and every one of you uh, have slightly different demographics and target audiences. But I could say, by and large, Facebook um, and Twitter are two that you probably want to be on for sure. And Twitter mainly from, the, uh, from, from a, uh, a PIO perspective. Um, Facebook because that's the biggest one out there. Uh, LinkedIn, the MRA, um, I did not look to see if the MRA has a LinkedIn page, but um, I think that that would be something that you should seriously consider because you're looking for donations just like all the other teams are out there um, and looking for potential corporate sponsors and they want it. that's one of the first places that any business person is going to go, any philanthropist is going to go. Um, you know, Google Plus, I keep hearing about Google Plus becoming more and more popular. I just don't see it happening. And then there's all the others that are out there from you know, Pinterest to Instagram. The biggest thing that you need to consider when, okay, the biggest thing that you need to consider, uh, I, the problem that I see a lot of people going through right now is, is they just jump into social media without really having any idea of what their strategy is going to be, uh, what what they're going to do on social media, how they're going to go about doing that. Um, and so it's really important to develop a written plan. 
And that written plan can be fairly simple. It can talk about, you know, who can post and how they post and when they post, you know, where you're going to post, what kinds of things you can post about, um, um, what the frequency is, you know, what your information is, and the relevance that it might have to the people that you're trying to reach. Um, and it's important to set up a schedule. Uh, in looking at a lot of the social media pages that were out there, um, I noticed that there wasn't a, a real um, uh, level frequency to when when posts happen. Um, so there, you know, somebody might post a bunch for a month, and then two months later, there was it was took another two months before the post occurred. Um, Posting something on a regular basis and having a schedule and some ideas to what you want to post about is important, which leads to the next thing is social media is all about a conversation. And um, so if you adopt the rule of thirds, the first thing that you want to do is you want to be social by answering and asking questions on, on all the media channels that you work with. You know, that may be you know, retweeting or reposting things to other from other people in your network. Um, the other thing is you want to share things. Uh, you want to uh, communicate with your commu uh, have a conversation with your community. So share content that's relative um, to your area, um, and that might be you know might be about uh, safety in 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 the back country. It might have something to do. It might deal with um, search and rescue techniques. Um, whoever, whoever you're trying to reach, uh, you want to share some of those things. And then if you do those two things, then you earn the right to talk about yourself and to talk about that successful mission you have or that next fund fundraiser you're going to hold. Um, or talk about that uh, award you got from the community. Um, the thing I see a lot of small nonprofits do improperly is use social media like advertising and just push, push, push information about you know things like their next fundraiser. If you can constantly, if that's all you do, you're going to lose your audience quickly. So what you want to do is, is promote and collaborate on social media. Um, and so, you know, here, here's an example where, where one, an individual team member, Neil, um, posted about his team's mission. Um, no Charge for Rescue is an ancillary um, social media site, uh, Facebook page, that uh, complements Search and Rescue. Um, you might want to post things that talk about um, how people can, you know, uh, can be more safe in the wilderness or be uh, more productive or to see more things and, uh, and to enjoy the wilderness better on your posts. And so one of the teams that I found, um, and I did not look at many, but I saw Larimer County up in Fort Collins, uh, Colorado, is doing a pretty good job. You know, they're, you know, they've done a, 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 so this first one, British Columbia Search and Rescue. So they're promoting another search and rescue organization, association. They're also saying that there's a nice uh, collection of preventative SAR uh, videos and uh, um, information that might be interesting to their community. They're also talking about things that have happened in the community. So, you know, they've been talking lately about the flood danger that's, um, that's happening in their community and sending people towards websites that um, can help them learn more about what the danger level is like. And then they also have done a nice job of doing some, some using a little bit of humor. You know, the Greeley earthquake was really nothing much to talk about, but the people in Greeley know about it. And so um, they've, they've been able to, to post something that's a little fun um, and lightens things up a little bit. So they're, they get kudos for doing a pretty good job. And I'm sure many of you out there are also um, 
doing a good job. I just had I just noticed that these guys. So one of the goals you should have from your from end goals really needs to be in using social media in all the content that you're going to present is the first place that somebody's going to go when they want to learn more about your organization is your website. And, you know, looking at a lot of the websites that are out there, you know, obviously some are better than others. Some could use an update. Um, some um, aren't very dynamic. They're very static. And so there's no reason for somebody to come back to it. Um, all of you should have a blog on your website um, that talks about things of interest. All of you should um, um, uh, be changing um, uh, the, the website on a regular basis and um, send driving, using social media to drive traffic to your website because that's where you can, you can ask for money, ask for donations, ask for help. You always want to have a call to action. And so your website can be a place for you to do that. Um, and um, that's all I have for this presentation. I think it took 50 minutes, including me spilling my water. Thanks, Rich. Um, let me go ahead and transfer this back over to my screen. If anybody has any questions um, or, you know, any further questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat slash questions section of your control panel. Um, and you should be able to see my screen now. Um, so we can go ahead and get started with a couple of the questions that we already have. Um, it looks like there's only one question, and um, I think they're uh, playing on your talking about humor, Rich. Um, they want to know which one of those dancers in that video was you. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could still move like that. <laughs> okay, um, there is another question. Um, what are your thoughts on... Um, people hunting down info from Facebook versus websites? People hunting down info from Facebook versus websites. Can they explain a little bit more? I don't. Uh, yeah, they're going to go into it in just a second. So we'll go on to the next question and then come back to that. Um, how do mission reports come into play with this? Well, remember I talked about stories? All your mission reports are stories, right? You know, you went out, you um, um, the call came in, you did this, you did that. Um, the mission reports and how many you do and how uh, uh, and and tracking that data is is the part that where mission reports can come in to help you do fundraising. Remember, um, funders, donors, you know, they want. Um, they want to know that um, uh, what you're do that you're well managed and and that you have impact in the community and so all your mission reports really can help to reinforce that impact you have in the community. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, that. The previous question was um, elaborated. Was do you think that Facebook um, could be or or is the same or does have the same value as a website regarding information? Um, and this is talking about your last point using social media to drive traffic to a website. So you know how did that dynamic work? Um, well, I know uh, you know. It's going to depend on your audience as to, as to and what you post. Um, I think they have somewhat equal equal um, value. Um, you know, once again, you don't want to look at all your media, all your communications channels as individual silos. They all work together to promote a particular um, 
uh, value proposition. And so to look at one being more important than the other, I don't think you want to do that. What you want to do is you want to say, uh, we have X amount of likes or people that see our Facebook page on this particular amount of time. Let's use that to drive traffic back to our website to give a more detailed picture. So, so if you write a blog post um, um, about anything, uh, safety for, for sake of argument, uh, if, you, if you write a blog post about it, you post about it and you want to drive traffic to the blog site, well, then, the, when, then the person, excuse me, yeah, to your website. So then the, so then the reader can, learn, can hopefully gets more engaged and wants to learn more about your organization. So they work hand in hand, and one's not more important than the other. I guess that's the best way to answer that. Okay, and then um, a follow-up on the mission reports question. Um, how do we? How do they use mission reports without compromising anonymity? And uh, there was a second part to that question. Well, go ahead and answer that first part, and then we'll get to the second part. Well, you can tell a story without divulging who it is. I mean, you can tell a story um, using facts from a mission report that um, um, outline, I mean, it, it really depends. You need to, your leadership needs to get together. Your PIOs need to get together. You need to talk about how you want to present specific information. I can't tell you what, what you should or should not post. That's, you know, that's an individual um, thing that each team needs to decide for themselves. But there are lots of ways that you can, uh, you can use something that you did on a mission or a training or, or anything else that you do um, to illustrate your, illustrate your value proposition, illustrate your impact in the community. Um, you don't have to name names. And, 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 and you don't want it to look like when you, if you do it, you don't want to look like a police blotter report. You know, you want it, you want it to be an entertaining story. Think about this. Um, Lawrence, um, Lawrence Gonzalez uh, wrote a book on uh, survival. And um, that book was all a series of, of vignettes about various situations and how people survived um, uh, through certain situations. Um, and you can you can use your mission reports in the same way, um, um, and you don't have to name names, and you, you, and, and you can go back in time to the point where maybe uh, so where the individuals are um, are not named or not even identifiable, and more importantly, you can use them as teaching moments. Um, you know, you know, why you know this situation caused. X, and therefore you could um, you can avoid this in the future by doing Y. I hope that answers your question. I think it did, and I think it answered the second part, which was, um, are there any best practices? So I think you went into that fairly well. Um, the next question is, how important is one-on-one -on -one contact with local media outlets like TV and newspapers? Well, if you can get, um, if you can build a relationship with media, it's just like building a relationship with a donor. I mean, they can be your, they can be your best friend. So, um, you know, if if, uh, and once again, that's one of the areas where um, don't look at individual ch channels as silos. Everything works to complicate to complement the other. So, if you can develop some Close, close personal relationships with media personalities or, you know, people writing the, the search and rescue blog, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, writing for the newspapers or other outlets. If you can develop some personal relationships and, 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 um, and cultivate those, uh, that's a great thing to do. So I wouldn't, uh, because you can tweet about things and, Send people, send the news media to to your Twitter feed. Um, doesn't mean that you want to give up 
social uh, or you know one-to-one -one conversations with them if you have the opportunity. Okay. Um, do you recommend leaving a Facebook page open for comments? to be left by individuals or moderating questions first? So how much control should be kept over Facebook pages? Um, you know, it kind of depends on whether you have the luxury of being able to do that or not. Um, and, you know, quite often um, comments are going to be um, reflections of what you've posted. So if you're thoughtful about what you're posting in the first place and about how you post, your, um, um, the chance that you're going to get negative posts is low. And even whether, even if you, um, you, know, you let people just post openly, you still have the ability to, to delete those posts after the fact. Um, I don't think it really matters. It's something that each team and team's leadership want, needs to be comfortable with. You know, it also kind of depends on how much can you um, can can your team um, you know monitor that, and what are your internal capacity for doing that. You know, you're going to get some you're going to get some some bad news every now and then, um, and uh, so. Uh, it just kind of depends. Sorry about not being more definitive than that. All right, the next one is, do you have any recommendations to convince old timers that are afraid of the Facebook and the Twitters that these are beneficial tools? Uh, the graybeards that are out there? Um, well, once again, um, like I mentioned in the, in the webinar, um, this, this is becoming more and more, um, you know, social media is becoming more and more prevalent. And um, just on a personal level, let me just present this to you. Um, I initially, I remember when uh, a friend of mine sent me a Facebook um, invitation to connect, and I was like, I did it just to be nice. And I didn't look at Facebook for the longest time. But now I'm finding that I'm using... Uh, social media to to curate a lot of the information that I I'm interested in, and that information can be professional. Um, that information can also be uh, personal, and so I'm connected with friends and family uh, that I haven't um, been able to connect to in years and years and years. Um, you know, family friends from when I was a kid. Uh, my cousin's kids I'm connected through Facebook. I, I learn about things that, that the families are doing, as well as learning things that are about professional um, uh, issues um, and political issues that I'm interested in. So social media for me actually gives me the ability to curate um, information that I'm interested in. So uh, try it, and uh, I hope you like it. Okay, um, and how can SAR teams better compete for funds with higher profile nonprofits in our, in their response area? Um, well, that's a detailed question, um, and I'd be happy to talk one-on-one -on -one with anybody who has that question. Uh, and the reason every team is going to be a little different uh, your competition is going to be a little bit different. Uh, in general, uh, you want to. Uh, you know, one of the things in doing strategic planning is you want to look at your competition. You want to look at, um, you know, who is competing for for uh, funding from all the different sources. Who's doing things similar to you? Uh, who's doing things uh, exactly like you, who's doing things that are um, um, re uh, competing for resources. Um, and then the most essential thing is, is to really look at your value proposition. What are you strongest at and how you position yourself with the, against the other competition so that you have a niche in the community. 
And then once you understand what, what, your, what your value proposition is, now you start working to promote that. And you start working to develop, to, to develop relationships with, um, with the various funding sources, uh, you know, all the different, um, uh, you know, all the different uh, foundations that are available to you, um, uh, individual philanthropists in the community, um, perhaps some, some government funding agencies. So, um, but it all really boils back down to your unique value proposition and that case for funding. And uh, once again, um, if you want to give me a call, send me a note. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about your particular situation. Um, give you some ideas on how you can work to better position yourself for greater funding. Okay. Um, the next one is, where can I find a class on social media for PIOs? I do not know. I Google it. Okay, good answer. Um, and then, uh, what about liability issues when using a photo or video that ends up showing a subject being rescued? It's great promotion of a SAR team's contribution, but could the use end up as a legal issue? Well, I'm not an attorney. Um, so, first thing I do is I talk to your legal counsel about some of that, and very different legal counsel might advise differently. Um, you know, you always, you never want to, um, so, Anything that's in the public domain, you can share. Um, anything that's a public event, you can share. Um, but there are copyright restrictions on using photos. So, uh, you know, the first thing I do is I would get um, uh, permission from the person being rescued that it's okay to use the footage or use the images. Um, and get them to sign off on on uh, on, a, on a waiver of such. Um, that that's the, probably your first level of protection. Um, and then using them in a tasteful manner. You know, um, once again, uh, uh, I don't think you want to. Uh, I certainly would never post photos or videos of deceased people, for instance. And I don't think many of you would either. Uh, or um, or people that are in, um, uh, you know, unfortunate circumstance. You just, you know, think about what your grandmother would like, you know, and um, and kind of go from there. But once again, I'm not an attorney, and so if there's something that you know uh, clicks a little red flag in your head, you might want to talk to your to your um, legal counsel before you post it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, that is all the questions that we have up right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start doing the wrap up. If you have any last minute questions, you can type them in quickly. Um, otherwise, um, if you have further questions that we don't get to today, you can email Rich at the email shown on the screen. It's rsolowski at comcast.net. Uh, the MRA webinar series is going to be hosting webinars frequently, so keep an eye on the MRA and PMI websites for future dates and topics. Those URLs are on the screen. That is also where you'll be able to find the recording of this webinar as well as the presentation slides. Um, and those will be posted sometime soon um, on both websites. For news and updates, including when future webinars are going to be, you can follow MRA and PMI on Facebook and Twitter, um, and the addresses are shown on the bottom of the screen. And I believe that is all of the questions. Um, and I got a request to type in the, um, the URL so that you can copy and paste them, so I will do that for you. Um, we really appreciate you joining us for this webinar. So I'm going to type in the URLs for you so you can copy and paste them, and it will post um, to your chat slash questions area. Um, and then after that, I'll be ending the webinar. So we really appreciate you all um, listening and attending this webinar. We hope that it was helpful. And thanks, uh, Rich, for presenting it. All right. Thanks for joining.
Have a good day. Have a great day, everyone.